Hello, hi everyone. Welcome to another edition of Thinking Things Through, Thinking Critically in Critical Times. I'm your host, Michael Sukoff. Today we have with us Peter Phillips, Professor Emeritus at Sonoma State University in Cotati, California. We're going to be discussing radical sociology, democracy, and power. Welcome to the show, Peter. Hi, Michael. It's great to be on with you. Same here. Uh, in addition to being a professor of sociology at Sonoma State for over 20 years, where you taught courses in political sociology, a sociology of power, sociology of media, and investigative sociology, you were director of Project Censor, a nonprofit media watchdog organization from 1996 to 2010, and president of the Media Freedom Foundation from 2003 to 2017. You were also co-host of the weekly Project Censored show on Pacifica Radio in Berkeley, California from 2010 to 2017. And in the interest of full disclosure, I was a co-host with Peter on some of those shows between 2016 and 2018. Peter, is there anything you'd like to add briefly about your background and interests? Well, no, that's great that uh, I officially retired from the university two years ago and uh but continue to teach classes until this last june um and we now live in albuquerque new mexico which is very fun all right great well uh as we've discussed this program seeks to help our viewers and listeners learn to think critically about important issues in the world today by showing them ways of looking at and thinking about issues from deeper more critical perspectives this includes learning how to question the ways in which these issues often are presented to us by the mainstream media. So Peter, before we begin, let's uh, give a brief definition for our viewers and listeners of what radical soci sociology is and what does the word radical mean? Well, the word radical means uh, addressing issues at the root. Um, radical is, is I mean, what is the root, root of the problem? What are the main concerns? And often, you know, political understandings and Social awareness is incidental. It's um, not grounded in what's really happening or, or who's making decisions in the world. So critical sociology is analysis of power and elites and how much control and influence they have over us uh, as citizens uh, in our daily lives and, and, and in control of the media and the stories we understand and hear. And um, our research at Project Censored was the identification of important news stories um, that the corporate media didn't cover. And that was ongoing now. It's in its 47th year. Um, and it's quite, an, it's quite an amazing thing because universities all over the, the country will um, submit news stories they think are important uh, um, and haven't been covered by the corporate media. So it's an amazing uh, kind of process that we go through every year. Yeah, I mean, I can't really add much to that, uh, but I did want to point out that the way that the term radical is used in our in our uh, mass media today, usually it's used to refer to like a fringe or what, what's been called an extremist point of view. And as you rightly point out, that's not the original meaning of the term at all. Radical means going to the root of things. Um, exactly. I mean, the use of the word radical is in itself a compromising of the term um, by the power elite to imply that uh, if you're radical, you're, you're um, a conspiracy theorist or you're in some way not to be trusted. And that, that's absolutely wrong. Right. Um, radical research is looking at the roots of what's going on and identifying um, you know, how decisions are made and who's in power. Right. And, you know, just to reemphasize the point about uh, uh, the word extreme or extremism is all over the media these days. It doesn't matter whether you're left, right or center. Uh, any group that seems to be, uh, I guess, out of the mainstream is called extremist. And uh, I'm wondering if use of this kind of lang language is, is, is dangerous in a way. Well, it's it's only dangerous if people are understanding it the way the corporate media is labeling it. Mm -hmm. And you have to be aware that that, of course, what is the content of corporate media is corporate 
you know, their point of view. And um, the <clears throat> big MSNBC and Fox and, and all of those are clearly in the in bed with their corporate owners in terms mm -hmm. of the kinds of ways they cover uh, issues in the world. Absolutely. Now, uh, let's talk briefly about uh, how your own work as a sociologist and media cri critic reflects this kind of perspective. How, and how does your work relate to radical sociology? Well, I have focused uh, throughout my career on uh, global elites or the elites in the United States, powerful people, uh, the one half of 1% of the world population that owns well over half of the wealth in the world. And uh, so that's been a continuing theme of mine. For 14 years, I was director of Project Censored and I really focused a lot on, on the media and the kinds of coverages that the media wasn't uh, providing. But um, I have always held the idea of, of elites and power. Um, my dissertation was on the Bohemian Club uh, based in San Francisco and uh, with their summer encampment that was up in the Russian River in Sonoma County, right by where I lived. Um, <clears throat> and those folks, every year get together a couple 3,000 of them and um, play together, drink together, and have conversations about what the world needs to do and where it needs to be developed. And, and these are elites from all over the world. So this is just yeah. one form of, the Bohemian Club is just one form of elite interconnection. Uh, right. But they really meet each other, you know, through boards of directors and, and policy groups like the Atlantic Council and uh, the Trilateral Commission and those where they are really setting agendas for the world uh, governments to follow. Yeah, and your, your uh, recent book, Giants, the Global Power Elite, uh, provides uh, a lot of empirical uh, evidence, not only for the existence, but, existence, but for their interconnections uh, globally. And um, would you want to say a little bit more about that book? In, that book uh, is in about global capital and how it's concentrated today. Um, five years ago, 17 major corporations, uh, money management corporations like BlackRock and Chase Manhattan Bank and those um, each had over a trillion dollars of assets that they were managing. Mm -hmm. uh, collectively, those 17 trillion dollar giants um, had $40 trillion of wealth that they manage. And most of that is money that they are managing from the upper 1% uh, ownership class in the world, um, which, you know, there's a few thousand, uh, 20 some thousand millionaires and, and 2,000 plus billionaires in the world today. And 80% of the people in the world live on less than $10 a day. So that's a what I would call a critical analysis. And when you just point out the differences of inequality in the world today, with most people are in debt or have zero wealth. Um, and for the middle class in the US, mostly it's the only wealth they have is in their home, uh, if they have a home. And, um, and that inequality compared to people that are billionaires and multi-billionaires, and of course, um, <clears throat> Uh, Musk is the is the richest at 180 billion, so it, it's it's an amazing analysis, and it isn't just about individuals because the managers of all this money are these giant uh, investment companies: Vanguard, BlackRock, J.P. Morgan, Bank of America, Barclays. Um, that can that they make the decisions where these trillions of dollars um, are going to be invested. And an update on that or a look at that today, it's closer to these 17 companies uh, have probably close to 80 trillion, maybe even 100 trillion. We're running the numbers right now, um, which is well over half of the wealth in the world. Um, and this is the free flowing capital. This is the, the money that, that's available. And that doesn't count uh, companies that, you know, their investments and their portfolios that include the buildings and, and, uh, patents and, and that sort of thing that have, have a great value as well. We're talking about the cash in the world. And that is highly, highly concentrated, managed by these companies. And these companies are all interconnected. They're all invested in each other. 
So it's one giant web of global capital that's uh, managed by fewer than 200 people. Um, and we look at who these people are, they're all multimillionaires and they're on these boards and they get free stock. Um, so this is what I would call a critical analysis um, of a global elite class that owns the world and uh, their decisions of continuing to, you know, <clears throat> sell gas and oil uh, are, are very harmless in many ways. And, you know, they, but they have more money than they know what to do with. And so they're constantly looking for other, other ways of investing capital. And how the U.S. has accommodated that is the wars that we've engaged in, um, starting in Vietnam and even going back to Korea. And then, of course, um, in, in the war on Iraq and, and the Middle East and all of that is very profitable for these companies. Um, because it's money spent on weapons and technology and that to wage war, and they make huge profits. So war making is a major part of the elite class's ability to um, continue to expand and grow and and give returns in the five to ten percent range for that for that wealth. So Peter, I'm imagining that someone who's watching or listening to this conversation now or reading your book. Uh, they might be uh, very discouraged. And uh, one of the things that I, I, the question that I keep coming back to on this show is, what can the ordinary person do about all this? And let me just say that, you know, if we're, if we're going to the root of, of a problem or thinking critically about it, we're not doing it just to do it, right? We're doing it because that information and knowledge could somehow be useful. So, you know, it's, I'm, I'll come back to this issue at the end, but it's, it's the issue of political power and agency. Uh, uh, what can a citizen of, of, of Hawaii, of, of the United States of the world do in the face of these overwhelming problems? That's always a very valid question. Um, and I think part of what our research is, you know, critical theory research in sociology is about creating instruments so people can understand what's going on. They can understand the power inequalities. They can understand uh -huh. that both the Democrat and Republican parties are in support of this global elite um, to varying degrees. And um, they uh, meet the agendas of the elite and capital. So governments in the West in particular uh, work entirely. Um, number one priority is to protect their capital and ensure that it continue to grow and um, expand with good returns. So that um, is an important piece of doing this kind of work so people can understand it. Um, <clears throat> Once, if you understand what's happening, and then you can start to be a critical voter um, and engage in questioning and finding candidates that support a position of greater equality and wealth sharing, um, that, that's vital. And very important part of this, of course, is the environment and the environmental crisis we're facing now. And elites just aren't willing to cut back and, and uh, make the changes that are necessary. Uh, to, um, you know, prevent uh, environmental collapse in the world. And uh, on this note, uh, uh, yesterday, uh, President Biden spoke, I think he was at, a, at some kind of reception in, in uh, Massachusetts. He spoke about the climate emergency as an emergency, but uh, he didn't officially declare a climate emergency, which it would enable him to use his authority as president, president to take uh, some major steps to address it. And you know, meanwhile, we have uh, temperature records being shattered all over the world, over in in Britain over the weekend, heat waves all over the planet, severe droughts. So I'm wondering what would it look like to bring a radical sociological perspective to this issue, both to understanding it and uh, figuring out ways to uh, address it uh, as, 
as a voter, as a citizen, or as a member of a, a social movement? Well, the awareness of what's going on and how that is plays uh, in the political process is 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 a vital understanding for mm -hmm. for, for people. And and there's a sense. I mean, people know that there's an elite. They know that there's really rich people. Um, what they don't understand often is how the networks of these people, the managers of this capital, influence their lives on a daily basis, and how the government is primarily concerned with protecting Wall Street and protecting stock profits and that. So that, that what's happened for people in, the, in just in the last six months is that, you know, you could get a mortgage under 3%, even last summer. And now it's it's close to double it's double that, mm -hmm. and so if you you're going to buy a house, the average house in in the in the U.S. is four hundred thousand plus. Um, that's that's a huge increase in your mortgage um, when you start saying you're at a six percent rate instead of a three, um, and that's something that people should understand. And that is designed to keep inflation down, even though we're running nine percent now. That's designed to not allow it to run away because they want to protect the bond market. And that's one of the safe places that uh, global power elite can park their cash is in municipal bonds and bonds um, that, uh, that they can buy and they get a three or 4% return, but it's guaranteed money and they don't have to pay income tax on it, um, which is just a benefit for the wealthy to, to uh, park their money somewhere where it's completely safe. Now, uh, so you, you made reference to uh, citizens empowering themselves by through the vote. Um, let's, let's talk a little bit about democracy and, and, and radical democracy. Uh, the term democracy is also bandied about frequently, uh, especially in the, in the corporate media. Uh, one of the tropes we hear often is our democracy, our democracy. So first of all, what, do you, what is democracy? And then what is radical democracy to you? Well, the, democracy is citizen decision-making and um, that should trickle up from, from the bottom um, and influence who's in power and, and how, they, how they got there. Um, that's not how it works. I mean, the parties select bona fide candidates that they consider will be good for the party and good for capital and good for the rich um, and protect uh, investments and the stock market. Both parties will push forward people that, that are in that area. And then of course, we've had the neoliberal agenda that's been, you know, been with us now for, for 20, 30 years, um, very conservative agenda that limits um, access to voting, uh, is trying to limit you know, people, what they get, what kinds of things they can say. So when we talk about democracy, we're talking about grassroots decision-making. And that could be democracy in your neighborhood, it could be democracy in your city, um, and, and that's people getting to have some input into policies and spending and making sure that corruption isn't happening. Um, and, and, and even at a higher level at your state and, and, and national politics. So that's, and it should be emerging from the people and not a top-down process. And that's mm -hmm. the difference here. So uh, just to push you on this a little further, uh, you, you, you stress the importance of exercising the vote, which I agree with. However, the way the whole uh, electoral and political system is is set up in this country uh one has to have access to huge amounts of of money and political power to even make a dent into the existing political system for example the republican and the democratic parties which uh much research uh uh contends are basically controlled by the money of huge corporations and other uh, contributors as long as the, the choices with which we're presented are sort of preordained, uh, it, it limits the real choice of the voter. So how, how can we get from that, from there, 
to a more truly uh, radically democratic system on the national level or even the local level? Well, it begins at the local level. And it's people engaging in conversations in their neighborhoods, deciding who they're going to have be on city council, taking a look at how the, the taxes are used in, in their vicinities, um, making sure that decisions are made that benefit the whole, that benefit the people in general. And that can, you want that to trickle upward. And so that people who are, you know, running locally and then they decide they want to run for state legislature and ultimately maybe Congress are rooted in a conversation that is pre-existing democratically as to what policies need to be implemented. So that's a vital thing. And, and people can engage in that on a daily basis. And that's with your friends and your neighbors and um, really thinking through and not being afraid uh, to talk about it. And uh, that's what something always bothers me. Well, let's not talk politics, you know, and usually that means let's not talk about Trump or let's not talk about Biden. Um, politics is what's going on in our neighborhood. Politics is the impact that high inflation has on families. You know, so a year ago, um, you, what a normal family would spend on, um, you know, insurance and food and, and everything that you need on a, you know, on getting the television working in that. It's now $500 more a month. And for most working people, $500 more a month out of their budget means that they're often going in debt or their credit cards are being used because they use up all the capital they have on a monthly basis. And they're still trying to have a standard of living that is middle class and their kids are safe and you know they've got a place to stay. And uh, increasingly the people at the bottom run out of money and um, we're seeing higher rates of, of, of unemployment among the, the needy and certainly um, homelessness has, has dramatically increased in this country and continues to increase. Um, so, you know, you reach a point where you can't afford to, to live somewhere. What's the role of social movements in bringing about a truly uh, grassroots democracy? Many people uh, point to the fact that, or argue that no real change has ever happened with, without a, a, a broad mass movement of people, such as the civil rights movement, the anti-war movement, and many others. So what's the role of those movements in bringing about these conditions? They're, 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 very, they're vital. And that's, you know, if you have a conversation about an AR-15 in your own neighborhood um, and, you know, ha saying, well, do you want everybody here to have one? Most people are not going to think that's a really good idea. Um, or I certainly don't. And I think anybody I know here isn't going to be aware of that or, or even think about it. So people like to hide if they have an AR-15, they like to hide it. And, uh, but publicly we, we can know where these are, they, they're registered guns and that's public information. We can find that out, but um, you know, the, the accessibility of weapons like that, uh, we're seeing devastating results in our, in our schools and in public. Well, uh, yeah, this is, this is uh, a somewhat intractable problem, and it has been for a while. And, uh, you know, just to go back to the theme that, that you started with in the show, uh, money and power, which we haven't even talked about directly, have a lot to do with why um, gun control legislation and other measures just keep going nowhere in, in our Congress. Would you agree? Yes, I would agree with that. And you know, the National Rifle Association, um, NRA. Um, in fact, we just, I was in Northern New Mexico, they have their central uh, training headquarters. They have this massive thousands of acre ranch where there's training and it's their national headquarters. Uh, um, it's, it's, it's quite amazing. It's right next to the National Boy Scout Training Center, um, which I thought was kind of interesting. In fact, last that, week, the New York Times had this story about how Boy Scout looking kids in Moscow or in, in Russia are being propagandized by, you know, the government and Putin and all of that, the negativity that goes with that. And I, the kid, these kids, they look like Boy Scouts. They had beanies on and badges and stuff. Uh, the Boy Scout, a memo, and I was an Eagle Scout, so I fully understand what happens there. 
Um, you're learning to shoot. You're learning to be patriotic. I mean, it's no different than Russia, what Russia does in terms of, you know, uh, propagandizing youth. Um, and I certainly would want to include, you know, building democratic awareness if I was in charge of the Boy Scout movement and help kids really, you know, involve and think through at a grassroots level what this all means. I mean, there's a bit of that. If you're a troop, you get to elect who your troop leaders are, things like that. But but it's still professionally top-down controlled. Well, uh, Peter, on, on that more uh, optimistic note, uh, that's all the time we have for today. We've been speaking with Peter Phillips, Professor Emeritus at Sonoma State University. Thanks so much again for joining us today, Peter. Michael, it's been great to be on with you. Thank you so much. Same here. This has been Thinking Things Through, Thinking Critically in Critical Times on Think Tech Hawaii. I'm your host, Michael Sukop. Thanks as always to our engineer, uh, Haley Akeda, the rest of the studio staff, and much appreciation to, I'm sorry, much appreciation to Jay Fidel. Please join us again two weeks from today at this same time, wherever you may be. Mahalo. Thank you so much for watching Think Tech Hawaii. If you like what we do, please like us and click the subscribe button on YouTube and the follow button on Vimeo. You can also follow us on Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, and LinkedIn, and donate to us at thinktechhawaii.com. Mahalo.